715 and the Frankish Kingdom is embroiled in a civil war. It's quite complicated, but to summarise, it was a civil war not between men fighting for the crown, but for men fighting for the title of mayor of the palace, who was in charge of the king's household. In Francia, the king was basically a puppet to whoever held this position, and so people wanted it. There were supposed to be two mayors, one for Austrasia, which was hereditary, and another for Neustria. There was an attempt to merge both mayoralities by giving them both to an eight-year-old, and revolt. A man named Charles Martel seized the opportunity that the chaos brought and managed to defeat his enemies in 718. Charles was given the title Duke of the Franks by King Chilperich II, who again didn't have any real power. Chilperich died in 720 and was replaced by Theodoric IV, who Charles had appointed. Charles saw to increasing the size of the kingdom, and by 730 it had expanded to this, with Charles conquering many of the German-speaking peoples to the east. To the west and the south, though, things weren't so rosy. The Duchy of Aquitaine had previously been part of the Frankish Kingdom, but had broken away in the Civil War and was now having trouble with their shared southern neighbour. This southern neighbour was the Umayyad Caliphate, which was, at this point, the largest and wealthiest empire ever assembled. The Caliphate, after numerous attempts, had started to conquer Aquitaine, forcing its Duke, Otto, to ask Charles for assistance. He granted it in return for Aquitaine's submission, and Charles mobilised his army and met the Caliphates here at the famous Battle of Tours, sometimes called the Battle of Poitiers. It was a decisive Frankish victory, and was thus cemented forever as one of the most famous battles in history. The exact importance of the battle is fiercely debated, with opinions ranging from it merely halting further raiding to saving Christianity in Western Europe. Anyway, the Caliphate would try again in the following years, but failed, and by 740 it ceased to be an existential threat to Francia. So in 737, King Theodoric IV had died, and Charles decided he didn't need to appoint another king, and so he didn't. He didn't take the crown for himself, though, and still ruled as mayor until his death in 741. Before his death, the territories of the kingdom had been split between his sons, Carloman and Pippin. In 743, they both chose a new king, Childeric III, but as expected, he had no authority. The first half a decade of their joint rule saw several revolts in the east and some clashes in the south, but it was largely stable. In 747, Carloman renounced his title and became a monk, leaving Pippin as the sole ruler. By 751, Pippin didn't really see the point of Childerich remaining on the throne, and so with the consent of Pope Zachary, got rid of him. He proclaimed himself King Pippin III, the first of the new Carolingian dynasty named after his father. Pippin was an accomplished general and leader, but not as much as his father or his son, and so he isn't very well remembered. He did, importantly, begin the close relationship between the Frankish kings and the popes. Pippin lacked legitimacy, which he could gain from the Pope, who in return would gain Frankish protection from the Lombards. Pippin aided Rome against the Lombard Kingdom several times, and carved out these territories for the Pope to govern personally, the Papal States. Pippin reigned until 768 when he died. He divided the kingdom between his two sons, Charlemagne the Eldest and Carloman. Charlemagne's name comes from the Latin Carolus Magnus, meaning Charles the Great. So Charlemagne and his brother didn't like each other, but fortunately this wouldn't be a problem for long, since in 771 Carloman found himself slightly dead. As such, Charlemagne gained the rest of the kingdom, beginning his transformative sole rule. Charlemagne's first priority was war and expansion. Over the course of his reign, Charlemagne went to war with pretty much everyone, but the reasons for these wars weren't exclusively territorial, but also religious. To the northeast of the kingdom lived the Saxons, who were pagans and had raided the kingdom for centuries. In 772, Charlemagne launched a raid to destroy the sacred Saxon tree called Eamonsil, beginning decades of warfare and forced conversions in the region. 773 saw conflict between the Kingdom of the Lombards and the Pope, and Charlemagne, who wanted to maintain this prestigious relationship between the Franks and the Papacy, came to the Pope's aid. It was a quick war, and the Lombards were defeated the next year when Charlemagne captured its capital, Pavia. He thereafter proclaimed himself as the King of the Lombards, but did keep the territory separate from Francia proper. He also conquered the Duchy of Spoleto and gave some authority over it to the Pope. The war with the Saxons continued at a grindingly slow pace until they rallied behind a man called Vidukind. Charlemagne was unhappy with this, and so in 782 he ordered the execution of over 4,000 Saxon prisoners, and in 785 Vidukind accepted baptism. The decades following this saw a major expansion of the kingdom, starting in 787 with the subjugation of Benevento here. The next year the kingdom expanded further east with the integration of Bavaria and the conquest of Carinthia, which brought the Franks into contact with the very wealthy Avars. It wasn't long before war broke out between the two and the Franks, led by Charlemagne's son Pippin, invaded. The Avars had lost by 796 and their royal residence, called the Ring, was sacked. Immediately after this, Charlemagne subjugated Croatia in these areas. The next year, Charlemagne finished subjugating the Saxons, so he could finally tick that off. In 799, he did the same to the Bretons, thus making the map nicer to look at, and he also conquered Barcelona. Thus, on the cusp of the year 800, the kingdom looked like this, and it's no wonder that it's sometimes referred to as the Carolingian Empire. Running this massive kingdom required ever more complex and capable methods of administration. The running of the kingdom revolved around the royal court, which regularly moved around the empire to various royal palaces, the most notable being here at Aachen. 
Arkham was not, as is often believed, the capital of the kingdom, but was an extremely important city in terms of administration and religious reform, as well as being Charlemagne's favoured residence. The kingdom was divided into counties and Missatica, which were administrative districts. They were often inspected by Charlemagne's emissaries, called the Missi Dominici, which is Latin for envoys of the Lord. The Lord in this case being Charlemagne and not, you know, God. The Missi were made up of two officials, one ecclesiastical, often a bishop, and one secular, often a count, who would make sure the king's authority remained intact and would report back on any potential issues. The church was extremely important to maintaining order and running the kingdom. Bishops and learned men of the church had very prestigious positions at court, and Charlemagne, who was a very pious man, took great interest in church reform. In order to push through reform, Charlemagne would issue capitularies, which were edicts enforcing changes to church practices. The most famous of these capitularies was the Admonitio Generalis, which basically dictated the rules for the everyday lives of Charlemagne's subjects and standardised church practices. It decreed that the Christian nature of the kingdom was immutable and that there was to be a kingdom-wide revival of learning, which we will get to in a minute. The year 800 saw the most famous event of Charlemagne's reign when he went to Rome after Pope Leo III had fled to him because some of his enemies had tried to blind him. Charlemagne went back to Rome with him to sort things out, which he did, and whilst he was there, Leo III crowned him Imperator Romanum, or the Roman Emperor. Charlemagne thus became the first emperor in the West since the fall of Rome over three centuries prior. This title didn't really do much except grant a bunch of prestige and wind up those in the still very much alive Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern Empire, often called the Byzantine Empire, was at this point being run by a woman, Irene, who had fallen out with the papacy and so instead of patching things up, they simply picked a new emperor. The big debate surrounding Charlemagne's coronation hinges on whether or not he was the first Holy Roman Emperor, or if it was Otto I in 962. Those living at the time saw no difference between the title bestowed on Charlemagne or Otto I, and the distinction exists in the mind of historians only, who like to categorise things. In fact, the title was seen as no different to the one bestowed on Augustus. So, as previously stated, Charlemagne wanted to ensure that learning was revived in his kingdom, and so he oversaw a period known as the Carolingian Renaissance. The reason for this, much like Charlemagne's conquests, were religious since it was believed that you couldn't be a good Christian until you knew what a good Christian was. It was seen as the duty of rulers to oversee the salvation of their subject souls, and so the exercise of power had to be combined with greater knowledge, a concept known as correctio. From across Europe, he sponsored scholars to come to his court, such as Alcuin from Northumbria, Paul the Deacon from the old Lombard kingdom, and Einhard, a Frank. Einhard, who was close to Charlemagne, wrote The Life of Charles the Great, which is one of the major sources about his reign. Schools were founded across the kingdom, the most notable being Met, Soissons and St Gaul, and greater emphasis was given to learning. The curriculum was standardised, literacy rates amongst the nobility improved, and a new means of writing was created, Carolingian minuscule. This would see the implementation of many grammatical conventions, such as introducing lowercase letters, question marks, and standardising letter forms. All of this led to a massive increase in the number of texts produced and a strengthening of the church, whose literacy rate made it indispensable to leaders. Charlemagne undertook much of this learning himself, and there is a common belief that he was illiterate. He probably wasn't, but there isn't overwhelming evidence either way. He didn't learn Latin, which was an official administrative language, until his later life, though, and Einhardt claimed that he could speak and read Greek, but the truth of that is less clear. So, now that Charlemagne was an emperor who'd reformed his empire and conquered most of his neighbours, there was only one thing left to do. Conquer more neighbours. In 805, after some raiding, Charlemagne took his forces to the east and subjugated all of these people, notably the Bohemians. In the south, there were some more conflicts with the Muslims, and by 812, the Franks had expanded to here. The only power in Europe that could challenge Charlemagne now was the Eastern Roman Empire, which held this territory, most notably Venice. In 812, Charlemagne won a diplomatic victory when the Byzantines recognised him as the legitimate emperor in the west, which might have had something to do with the fact that he had an army just outside of Venice. Whilst the size of the Frankish kingdom may have dissuaded aggression by the Byzantines, it didn't deter the Danes. Pretty much immediately after Frankia's borders had expanded to reach Denmark, raiding had begun up and down the coast. These raids were pretty devastating, but ultimately were nothing compared to what Charlemagne's successors would have to endure. Charlemagne's 47-year reign would come to an end when he died in 814. His eldest son, Pippin, had died in 811, and so he had only one legitimate son left, Louis, better known as Louis the Pious. His reign was somewhat less successful than his father's, though, and he ended up dividing the kingdom up between his sons, which led to the rise of two major states, in the west, the Kingdom of France, and in the east, the Holy Roman Empire. So Charlemagne is remembered as many things, a conqueror, a patron of scholars, as a reformer, and as a protector of the church. After his grandsons divided the empire between them, Charlemagne was considered the father figure of the new states which came out of it. Much of his reign was driven by his desire to be a great Christian king. He believed it was his duty to subjugate the surrounding areas and force conversions within them in order to save the souls of those who lived there. It is important to remember that much of his great legacy was built upon the work of his forebears, Pippin and Charles Martel, without whom there may not have been a Frank here at all. One thing is almost universally agreed upon though, Charles most certainly deserved to be remembered as the great. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching. There are some book recommendations in the description below if you'd like to know more.